Um, I'd like to start um, just a brief introduction. You know, I've worked with many people in this room over the years and have had long relationships. I have tremendous respect uh, for everyone here and everyone that's worked on um, wildlife fertility control. It's never easy. Um, there's a lot of controversy, as you know, and whether I, my focus is primarily on deer. So my, total, my title probably should be application of even-toed ungulate um, research and management since much of my work has been with, uh, with deer as well as with uh, feral uh, even-toed ungulates. And I wanted to share some of those experiences and how it might be relevant to future management of, of, uh, of horses and burros. Um, I'd also like to say um, I don't really have an agenda. I'm a pretty logical um, type person that's focused on problem solving. I see a pretty big problem with horses, so I find it interesting uh, and challenging opportunity. Um, and I think everyone in this room, uh, I would say for the most part, believes that wildlife should be both healthy in, in its relative abundance and in individual health and the health of the environment. I think that's our overall goal. And so we need to collectively work together and not attack each other with different people's ideas or, or conflicts. Um, I would feel confident that everyone in this room um, has the utmost respect for, for both wild and domestic animals and how they're treated. And I don't think anyone has malintent um, during their research. Obviously, John's putting, um, has to use lab mice to test his pellets. It's not ideal, right? We have to use um, lab animals. We're taking ovaries out of horses to look at a treatment of a vaccine. Not ideal. Do these individuals um, respect the animals they're working on? Of course they do. But the ultimate goal is solving these problems in the most humane manner. And, um, and I don't want to share with you my thoughts on how, from a practical perspective, we might look at wild horses and burrows. Um, and you can feel free to attack me, but it's just my logical brain thinking about how would we do this on a very large scale. 30 million acres of BLM land excites me. I don't find that as, as being daunting. I find it as a tremendous challenge that I think is very feasible uh, to address. With that preaching, uh, we'll move on. So um, Cheryl did a great job uh, with introduction on what the background is. I don't get, need to get into how many horses are in you know, off-range pastures um, um, and the issues around that. Um, I want to, and again, this is not a debate. I'm not here to challenge vaccination. Uh, I met John in the early 90s, um, spent a long time, and I was starting my PhD trying to figure out how do we come up with an injectable um, compound that would inhibit reproduction. We've all been working towards that end game. Um, but unfortunately, as we've seen today, we still don't have that one shot long acting vaccine. So under what circumstances may sterilization via surgical means, um, uh, which also may be Dr. Bruner's end game, because I have worked with, with Doug on those vaccines on deer, um, we may be able to do it through a vaccine or do we have to uh, do it surgically? And how does that compare to situations where vaccination might be more practical and appropriate? Um, I'll be talking about the history of even-toed ungulate management um, and how that might relate to our present issue. What strategy might we use to try to scale some of these concepts so that uh, we're not just looking at little small herds, not that there's problems with those programs, but how do we get past looking at a micro scale and get into a macro scale? Um, and then we're all somewhat familiar, but get into some of uh, the reasons why um, nothing's really happened to speak of as many of there's these small trials um, we still have tens of thousands of horses on the range. And one other point I'd like to make is um, I'm not a range ecologist. Um, so whether there are um, three times as many horses um, relative to AML, a hundred times, uh, some people argue that AML is accurate. Some people argue we can have a million horses on the range and we should have no cattle. I have no opinion on that. That's not my place. I'm looking at how do we mitigate an overabundance of horses in, in some of these landscapes. So right now we have a pretty simple program, right? We round horses up, I'm sorry, we gather horses and we put them in a pasture. I want to find a solution or I would like to look towards the ultimate solution, which may not be whether it's surgical or chemical, 
but I want to take zero horses off the range, right? We don't want horses in an artificial environment living for 30 years. I don't think many people like that outcome. So I want to figure out how do we make concessions and what management technique we might use, right? It may not be perfect, whether some people are against surgery, we have abscesses in animals. With some vaccines, you may have to round that animal up twice, creating two stressors in order to get an adequate immune response. There's a lot of different pros and cons, but ultimately, I would have the least number of animals removed from the range uh, for their individual well-being. So how do we get there and what type of, of uh, compromises do we have to make during the treatment process to meet that goal? Um, we've seen many of, the many of the summaries on research that's taken place to date. And um, my goal, as I'm going to um, get into here briefly, is how do we take what technology we have now and let's make it work. Let's get into a larger landscape environment and see if we can inhibit reproduction in a high enough percentage of the animals to have a management outcome uh, that is near um, what our objectives are, which again, obviously vary based on species and location. Um, so Stefan, you, know, you need 80% just to stabilize in a horse. The sons of guns, which is good, um, they live a long time. But then it's a son of a gun because they live a long time. Um, so with low mortality rates, and you, you can't have much reproduction in order to have that population continue to grow. So that's a big battle. So even if we had most of our vaccines, as we've seen, they're anywhere from 85 to 95% effective. So even if I captured and treated 100% of the horses, if we're only 90% effective, we're barely starting to be able to potentially um, incur a population reduction. It would be very minor. So by definition with a vaccine at this stage of our technology, um, we can barely stabilize a population if we handle every horse in the environment in which we're working. Or, other, or even with deer, it's very similar. So we don't have a single dose. As John mentioned, you know, we've gotten away from a, a primer and a boost to be effective and then come up with a tertiary treatment to have longer sustained efficacy but we don't have a one-shot vaccine. And I don't even know if that's ever going to be feasible. So how does that hamper our ability to really, um, uh, in, in, unless Dr. Bruni works magic with Doug, and we can get a vaccine that is efficacious enough uh, with a single injection that may render an animal infertile uh, for life. Um, so I'll continue to keep an eye on your work. Um, so uh, given the fact that we have um, this lack of a single dose, the only thing that mimics that right now is we can do chemical occlusion, uh, similar to a, vac to, a, to a vasectomy, but really have a surgical approach is all we have to date that's nearly 100% effective with a one-time administration. So that animal only has to be handled once versus the possible additional stressors of having to boost it in the landscape. So what I've tried to do with deer, um, and I would argue it has some use for horses, is how do we use a surgical method um, to serve as a surrogate for our vaccines until our vaccines can simulate the outcome of a surgical procedure. So uh, I've been watching vaccine development since the early 90s. It moves very slowly. So as optimistic as we'd like to be today, you're looking at many years before you're going to have a vaccine, if, if at all in our lifetime, that could be a single administration with a very high percentage efficacy. So I don't want to dampen the spirit. But at the same time, I want to emphasize we may have to look at surgical methods in the interim to see the, the impacts on a population that we need so we don't have to either kill animals or we don't have to pull them off the range, depending on the species we're, we're speaking of. Um, so dealing with even-toed ungulates, um, what we've done, and, and I don't want to digress into the fact that these are, are lethal projects, but we don't have many lethal projects on equids. So, at least in the, the realm of ungulate management, we've had many large-scale uh, lethal programs that we've learned a tremendous amount on how do you address an animal with many, many individuals in a very large landscape. How do you accomplish these programs successfully and has tremendous relevance, I believe, to horse and burrow management. So um, what's, and part of this has come out of the field work that we've done, um, and I think Kayla mentioned it, and and others, you have to be highly strategic. 
know, when you get into the management realm versus the efficacy realm. And how do you plan and think about a project? What are the, what are the tools we have? What's the animal's behavior? What are the legal limitations? What are the social limitations? How do we pull that all together? And then once you start your implementation, it has to be highly structured and strategic. You cannot go out. I can't have John driving over and watching the sunset on his way to Billings, right? That doesn't get me from point A to point B. Um, I'd love to join him, but um, I think I'd go crazy because I'd be focused on how many animals we still had to capture. Um, it has to be intensive. You can't go willy-nilly and have, you know, volunteers are great, um, but there are tremendous limits to volunteers when you have a scaled, highly complex project integrating people that do not have professional expertise um, in that discipline. Um, you need people with long-standing skills. You can't just pull people intermittently, give them a two-day training, and expect them to have the degree of skill it takes to pull these programs off in very complex environments. Um, and then we need to... Um, get to the point where we're actually quantifying the population impacts, right? What is happening in the field? We can't say, oh, geez, I treated, you know, 181 horses. Um, yeah, well, what happened, right? How many horses did we start with? What's the subsequent population? We can't just look at reduction in, in folding rates. We have to look at a population change. And we're not really at that point yet. We haven't seen that much, but we have seen that with, some, with other species. Um, so... The other advantage I see it as, some people see these big, massive, inaccessible landscapes as being overwhelming. I'm like, I will take that any day over working in New York City, suburban Cincinnati. You give me big space where I have much more latitude, I have helicopters, aircraft, I have a lot of ways to access animals, and I don't have as much limits as I do working in a very densely developed environment. So to me, working on horses is actually much easier uh, from a technical and logistical perspective. Um, so what I want to, we don't have, I can't share specific data on this project, but I want to understand the context behind it. So I was approached by New York City, and they have, we have uh, what I'd almost call a superabundance of animals on, uh, on Staten Island. And I've lived in Connecticut most of my life, and I avoid New York City at all costs, okay? I drive over the Tappan Zee Bridge and go all the way around to New Jersey if I'm going south or west. It's pretty simple. So I get a call from New York City, and we have an abundance of deer. I'm like, I'm not quite sure where I knew Staten Island existed, but I'm actually quite familiar with Staten Island at this point, whether I like it or not. Um, but it's a unique situation. Um, they had uh, increasing levels of deer vehicle collisions. They had very, very rudimentary population estimates. Um, it's illegal to discharge a firearm in New York City. You cannot hunt in any of the, any of the five boroughs in New York City. We had an animal um, uh, welfare-oriented mayor and chief of police. So as you can imagine, as I'm giving these little criteria, anything lethal is long gone off the table. So then the option was, all right, if we're going to use a non-lethal method, what is that? Well, having worked with deer for nearly 30 years, and understanding what it takes to capture and treat a very high percentage of a population, uh, unfortunately, I took female treatments off the table. Well, first I took vaccines off the table because we were not going to be able to treat these animals on multiple occasions. It's 60 square miles. It's your 40,000 acres. And it's a very challenging environment to get around. In rush hour, it could take you three hours to go the equivalent of 10 minutes. Um, and there's a huge population that's using this landscape that's hard to work around. So um, it's, but it was a challenge to me that um, we can demonstrate, we can scale a micro, most of the projects on deer that everyone's done, they're a couple square miles. We got up to six square miles, and it's like we have deer throughout the northeast, right? So can we take this to another level? So in order to do that, the only option that I can come up with, which still somewhat seems ludicrous to today, was to treat males. And that's because it's an island, so I don't have immigration issues to speak of. And the surgical procedure on a male is much easier than a female, doing a vasectomy versus an ovariectomy, which we often do on, on suburban female deer for our research. Um, and the um, males are more, at least with deer, are more solitary. So as I dart and I have a one-dimensional approach, which I'll get into. I have to, as I dart individual animals at a time, if I have a female social group and I dart one of those animals, I have the rest of them that witness it, get smart, and start to learn to avoid me. 
So my rough calculations are I'd be very lucky to get 70 to 80 percent of the females if I use a surgical approach with them. And by definition, I would fail because there'd still be too much residual reproduction where that population would never be reduced. Um, so um, with males, I felt confident I can get a very high percentage of them, work to that population systematically, um, and get into an environment that was, um, again, less than, than easy to, um, to get access, get the local people supportive, um, very challenging. So fortunately today we have dark guns that you can reasonably hit what you're shooting at. Um, they are the, the transmitter technology for tracking when you're capturing is really advanced. Um, the reliability of the darting systems, the drugs, the immobilization agents we have, all these things have kind of come together at this stage of, um, of my career that have allowed this project to be feasible. Um, we have to monitor this and ensure that we're actually having population level effects. We are somewhere between, uh, we're definitely over 90, probably closer to 95% of the males on this island, 60 square miles, have all been vasectomized. Um, kind of hard to believe at this point after two years and, and almost going to the point of being insane, uh, the, the amount of intensity that it takes to accomplish that outcome. Um, but we're at the point where our reproduction is going to be well below mortality and we will see this population decline. Um, so the one disadvantage of this, and I'll get into that with, with the horses and burrows, is we, could only, we couldn't drop net there. You're not going to set drop nets up in New York City. One, because someone's going to take it and make it disappear. They're going to vandalize it. There's not many places to set up drop nets. So I really can only dart deer on an individual level, which is highly impractical. And any of you that have worked with wildlife, if you expose them to a threat, they're going to learn what that is. And when you only have one threat and you can't really change that method of getting to those animals, your, your returns on your effort diminish appreciably. So we've been very fortunate, again, using males as our, as our focal sex to be able to work through those animals. And at this point, I can honestly say we're not getting outsmarted by residual deer. We simply get outdumbed, right? They just don't come in when we're there. And one of our bigger problems is we have um, mostly subordinate males remaining. So when you have to get those residual individuals that are yearlings, two and a half year olds, and they have to get through 15 adult males that are huge to get to the corn pile, that's really our challenge at this point. So there's little technical things that we'll work through, um, but again, demonstrating that by scaling this and do it intensively and systematically, you can be successful. Um, so if we're looking at horses and burrows, um, and Kayla already got into this, it's like, you need to analyze, but not, I don't want to just analyze on one small herd. I want to analyze in an HMA. I want to analyze across all HMAs, right? Well, how can we get in there? What's our vehicle access? Um, what's our access by ATV? Um, what's our access by horse? How, you know, obviously a helicopter by default, we can get anywhere we want to be unless there's flight restrictions under some wilderness area um, locations. But so access is critical. Well, how does that create, uh, that directs what our methods might be? Um, do we have areas that, uh, I think Stefan said, that people assume there's no horses? and then areas with higher concentrations with better habitat, water, um, other, other mechanisms of, of determining um, whether we're going to be dealing with a situation where you can only corral because there's so many, or whether they're more sparse and you can individually engage them with, with remote darting, for example. Um, approachability with any species, right? It turns into a whole nother world when you go from an animal that you can get 30 yards from and wants to eat an apple out of your hand to an animal that you only see dust when you approach it in that environment. Those are two different worlds, and to assume they're the same or similar and that you're going to use the same method, um, it would approach insanity to, to be thinking on that wavelength. Um, corrals have been proven, right? BLM uses it, other groups use them. That's the only way you're going to capture a high volume of animals in a huge landscape. So where can we get them? How do we trailer them in? Do we helicopter lift them in? How may, what percentage of that population can we get in a corral trap, regardless of the method we're treating them with, as a critical tool, and at what point does it become too complicated to get that tool into a remote area where you're going to use a helicopter to dart or use some other remote method to engage those animals? Uh, and ultimately, some animals are going to be resource limited, and we can manipulate them. Others, you're not going to have any luck and you're going to have to go to that horse or round that horse up in order to get it in hand for treatment. 
Um, and then it's strategy, right? So if you have corral traps and you have helicopters and we can manipulate animals with remote dark guns at water holes or bait sites, how do we transition from one strategy to the next, right? When, when, is, when is your corral trap been exhausted? Now you're wasting time and you should be shifting to another method, another location to keep your productivity up. That's part of the strategy and how to try to implement these, these types of multi capture or multi-treatment methods. Um, and you have to do this fast. We can't dilly-dally, do some horses this year, some the next year. You have reproduction in between. That means there's more horses that have to be treated and more horses that potentially have to be taken off the range at some point. So you have to make up your mind, get in, and act uh, uh, very uh, efficiently and rapidly. There was just a, an article recently where there's folks, um, there's been a lot of lawsuits, right? I'm just getting introduced to the whole horse lawsuit thing. It's like almost part of the management plan. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of almost absurd, but uh, it's a reality. We've dealt with it some with deer. Um, but that clearly could put an impact on how many resources someone wants to try to allocate or even try to initiate research if you're going to have 10000 or $100,000 in legal fees and in essence, in my mind, the horse suffers, the burrow suffers, right? They're the ones that ultimately end up with excessively used range, and we're busy bickering amongst ourselves. So we need to, again, kind of work together with all groups, interest groups, stakeholders, uh, government agencies, to try to come up what's best for that animal and the resource and put some of our, our individual um, interests aside. We want normal behavior. So some treatments may not be considered normal. Um, I would look at doing a vasectomy on a horse gives you the same behavior as if you use PZP, right? You have a multiply cycling female because she's not being impregnated because the male's not viable. So you can use approach that is um, uh, surgical and permanent that mirrors some of the favorable elements of a, of a vaccine. And ultimately, we need to start thinking about using some tools that people feel nervous about, right? A remote control darting system, right? Are we going to accidentally hit an animal inappropriately? Are we going to have a human interaction that's negative, right? We need to start getting beyond some of these um, elements and take some risks if we're going to be successful in this. So um, my thought, and I'll conclude so we can get on with questions and, and dinner, is um, do we go out and possibly surgically sterilize male animals on a large scale it's a very low invasive procedure. We can handle animals in remote locations um, without harm. It's permanent, and I'm very confident you can treat a very high percentage of animals in a landscape to inhibit reproduction in females. And you can, if you round a portion of these animals up, we can give PZB22 or Gonacon to some females in there while you treat the males. Use other remote capturing methods on males in the field where you may not be able to do a female surgical sterilization. There's, a, there's a, many ways to combine methods, analyze those outcomes, but I believe it's very feasible on a large scale. You know, we're looking at millions of acres and be able to use a surgical method as a surrogate in the meanwhile, because if we wait until the magical vaccine comes about, we're going to have a thousand times AML across the landscape and we're going to end up either killing horses or horses are going to end up going uh, into long-term uh, off-range pasturing, uh, neither of which uh, anyone in this room wants. So just opening up thoughts and discussions on how uh, we may move all these discussions uh, here today forward. Anyway, thank you for your time and I want to thank the Bot Stever Foundation and obviously HSUS for facilitating this meeting and helping uh, bring us all together to uh, to advance our, our options to uh, humanely manage wildlife. Thank you.